matter what you mean on, on 20, he said, by me you are master of the words you don't say and a slave to the words you do say. Mm -hmm. So I told this young man yesterday in his enthusiasm, he said, man, it took me four years in college to tell me something that an old master told me back uh, 20, 30 years ago. But it is true, you know, uh, the, this blogosphere, this whole idea and concept of how we communicate one with another, it is so very, very important. You know, they give me a lot to say here, and a lot, but I'm not going to try to uh, speak to all these perspectives that they have given me. I'm going to suffice it to say that we are very fortunate in there because we have a panel of experts who want to who inform us and lead us through this current phenomenon and lead us out of this so we can, as we leave here, we can understand how we can become uh, wealthier, how we can become richer, and how we become, can become more effective, more potent Americans, and also how we can become more potent as citizens of the world. This internet, this ability to communicate internationally, just think of this. There are 90 million Africans or descendants of Africa who live in a diaspora. 90 million. If we could just communicate, and we do have that capacity, to 10 to 20 percent of them, just think of the effect that we would have on the international global market in the international global market. Just that ability. So we're saying right now on the gold mine, and I might conclude with this. It's an old story. I heard it some years ago about this uh, uh, South African farmer who became frustrated because the farm wasn't producing anything. And he was reading a magazine one day, and they told him about a uh, magazine, a little story magazine about uh, a gold uh, mine, about gold mines, and how was the gold mines when he was coming. And so all of a sudden, in his first place, he said, "Well, I'm quitting. I'm giving up. I'm gonna give up my farm, and I'm gonna go out and mine for gold." And he did. Never heard from them again. The people who bought the gold, bought the farm, uh, from this man, one day was out plowing the field. Looked down, saw a shiny object, and there was one of the largest uh, gold mines existing on that farm that was never necessarily uh, discovered. He saw this, this, this well, not gold diamond, I'm sorry, diamond largest diamond that it ever existed. Uh, and it's where the, the, the rear diamond mine was ultimately located on this man's gold mine. So the story of this is this. Sometimes what we need uh, is in our own backyard. We just have to claim it. Let's not go out seeking. Let's know, know where we are. Know the power what we are, uh, that we have in our own backyard. And I think that that power can be more uh, expressed to you and your understanding at the end of this forum. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I had a I had, I had vote. So I, had, I, wanted, I wanted to listen and I had to go back to the field and vote. Thank you. Well, it's interesting that uh, Congressman Rush talked about the you know, blogging to the, what do you say, booty shake? <laughs> and, you know, even my next book is about go-go music. And um, this is just a small anecdote to just show the power of what he's talking about. As many of you know, go-go music is um, Washington, D.C.'s funk uh, music culture. And one of my people who I'm profiling in the book just started a, uh, a West uh, radio station called Go-Go Radio. Four months ago, he started it, and 
four months in, last in the month of August, they had six million page views for this radio station, um, web-based radio station. You know, those are you know coming from the root, which is also a black uh, website. It's, those numbers are absolutely phenomenal. Uh, phenomenal. I mean, and, and they are marketable, and that's a business, and that just sort of sprang up organically overnight. There's no iTunes. It's completely independent, um, and so it's just incredibly powerful that we can't bridge this space between the booty shake and, <laughs> and the bloggers. So, um, so with that, I'm going to go go ahead and go through. Um, yeah, I want to stress, I'm going to read everybody's bios on the panel just so that you get an idea of how much power is sitting here in this room and, you know, so that you know if you want to follow up with them afterwards. But, you know, one of the cool things about the web and blogging is that it is not, even when you're a blogger, you're, you have the platform, but it's always in conversation with people on the outside. So, you know, for the, for the next couple hours, you know, we really want to have this, Conversation between um, you know the people on the plant, uh, the, the panel, and, and yourselves because there's there's sort of like a decentralization of power. You know, sometimes you don't know who's leading the conversation. Or is it the reporters writing the story and the bloggers, or is it the commenters who sort of take up take off with it and taking it to some other place? So um, you know, in that spirit, I'm just bear with me. I'm going to uh, read the bios, um, then we'll quickly get into the discussion. Okay, first up we have Adam Connor. Adam is the Washington DC Associate Manager for Privacy and Global Public Policy at Facebook.com where he focuses on government and political outreach and directed the company's 2008 election efforts, which we know is incredibly um, successful and important work that Facebook did. In 2009, Politics Magazine named him their rising star one of their rising stars, an award that goes to people under 30, people 35 and under who have already made a significant mark in political consulting or advocacy. Prior to opening Facebook's Washington, D.C. office, Adam was the director of online communications for Congresswoman Louise Slaughter, chairman of the Rules Committee in the U.S. House of Representatives. He previously served as the deputy director of online communications for Forward Together, the Presidential Exploratory Committee for former Virginia Governor Mark Warner. Adam holds a bachelor's degree in political communication from the George Washington University. So, welcome. Stacy Ferguson. Stacy Ferguson is a senior attorney in the FTC's Division of Advertising Practices, where her workload focuses primarily on advertising issues related to the internet and high-tech goods and services such as spyware and adware, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, digital rights management, and word-of-mouth marketing online. Ms. Ferguson is a member of the endorsement of the Endorsement Guides Education Outreach Team and has assisted in coordinating the Commission's town hall meetings on mar mobile marketing and digital rights management. Ms. Ferguson currently serves on the Interactive Technologies Task Force, the state, Federal State Law Enforcement Spyware Task Force, and the Diversity Council in the FTC's Bureau of Consumer Protection, as well as on the FTC-wide Social Media Task Force. Prior to joining the FTC, Ms. Ferguson practiced law at Cross Proskauer Rose LLP, where she worked in the areas of privacy and intellectual property law. She received her JD from Howard University School of Law and her BS in telecommunications from the University of Florida. Welcome. Next is David Stein, co-founder and chief technology officer for First Media. David is a co-founder of First Media and has served as its chief technology officer since 1995 and as a director since 2000. In 1995, he created the Nerd World Media Internet Subject Index, one of the earliest search directories on the internet. From 1991 until 1996, David was director of new product development for Demiris Corporation, a privately owned software company located in Burlington, Massachusetts. Next we have Crystal High. Crystal Lauren High is the editor-in-chief of Politics365.com, an online magazine focused on empowering minority communities with a positive media platform for the exploration of issues critical to our livelihoods and affecting the nation at large. She is also the policy counsel for the New Media Entrepreneurship 
Conference, an organization dedicated to fostering the creativity, talent, and business acumen of the next generation of multicultural new media. Crystal has worked as a research analyst for the Minority Media and Tech Telecommunications Council and, and the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies Media and Technology Institute, where she's developed a subject matter expertise on broadband adoption patterns among minority, low-income, and underserved populations. Prior to embarking on a career in media and telecommunications, Crystal practiced employment and business litigation at LeClaire Ryan LLP. She obtained her BA cum laude from Davidson College, where she was inducted into the leadership fraternity Omicron Delta Kappa. She received her JD from Washington and Lee School of Law. She's a native of Miami, Florida, and currently resides in Charlotte, North Carolina. We have Donna Person. Donna Person is a senior director of operations and business development for BET Digital, a division of BET Networks. Ms. Person develops, negotiates, and implements strategic digital initiatives which often require forming partnerships, joint ventures, and business development agreements with the other Fortune 500 companies. Previously, Ms. Person was a member of the strategy and business development team for BET Network. A few of Ms. Person's past initiatives included managing the business formation and planning behind the launch of Centric, BET's newest channel, developing an original programming strategy that drove 20% of rating drove a 20% ratings increase for BET networks, negotiating a contact partnership with Verizon's VCAS mobile the business unit, and developing an operational plan for BET's vertical ad network. Donna holds a BS from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and an MS from the University of California, Berkeley. She's an alumna of Betsy Magnus Leadership Institute for Leaders in Cable, and was featured as a woman on the rise by Uptown Magazine. She sits on the board of directors for College Dance Collective, is a member of the Northwest Columbia Heights Community Association, and is treasurer for the Meyerhoff Alumni Association. services that, that other people are building. If you look back in the last 15 years, 15 years ago, if you were starting your own blog, you'd have to build your own content management system, you'd have to set up a hosting contract, 
there were too many things in the way. Sometimes you'd have to hire a programmer just to, to do it right. Um, so the ease of being able to publish is, is to me, one of the most exciting things. Um, challenges is, and, and this is where, where my business has some expertise, is, is in revenue. You know, how do you generate revenue um, from, from your blog? If you want to turn it into a business, the revenue is, is one of the most important aspects. And how do you do that? And that's a challenge. It's a challenge for small publishers. Um, it's very hard for a small publisher to approach an advertiser. Um, it's hard for publishers. It's also hard for publishers to build an audience to make it worthwhile uh, for, for advertisers. So I think revenue is probably one of the hardest things to, uh, to build and to allow you to publish independently and leave your day job. So what's exciting in this space, you know, I think uh, the congressman hit the nail on the head. The really exciting thing is that it gives us an opportunity to develop a voice. It allows us to um, better serve a niche that may not otherwise have been served. You know, with Politics 365, our entire focus is speaking to politics and policy in a manner that resonates with minority communities. So we're able to online, you know, take national issues of importance and skew them in a way that um, really deals to, with the issue of how is this impacting communities of color? What is it that we need to do differently? You know, whether you're talking about uh, health care, whether you're talking about internet regulation issues, whether you're talking about, you know, foreclosures and the economic crisis, we are able to, you know, uniquely situate our opinion in a way that allows us um, to capture kind of the, the minority voice, at least from our perspective, because obviously we're not a monolith. Um, I think in terms of, you know, challenges, it's been mentioned some here, and you know, part of the challenge is not only developing your audience, but you know, making yourself appear to be a legitimate news media source. Like Politic 365, we bill ourselves as an online magazine. We don't call ourselves a blog. You know, part of our purpose in that is saying, look, we are legitimate. We have very critical perspectives. We have a wonderful team of writers, and we are just as adept at communicating the cultural experience that's important to everybody as some of these larger outlets. So making other people uh, buy into that, understand that, and realize that we are a platform that can be valued and leveraged uh, for greater cultural communications is where I think the challenge comes in. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would say that the most exciting development in my eyes has been the diversity of opinions that have really developed online. <coughs> um, I think that now, as blogging has become easier because of the technology aspects, you don't need to be a programmer to actually launch a blog. We've seen that you can see, if you're interested in food, there are thousands of blogs out there that you can check out. If you're interested in hair, beauty, fashion, whatever you're interested in, you can find that particular voice that speaks to you. And um, you know, I think that the diversity of opinion is very important. We need to protect that. And so I would value, I value that as the most exciting development. Um, the challenge really, especially from an ad network's perspective, is the pricing pressure. What we've seen is that African American uh, viewers are not valued in the same way. And we've seen the pricing pressure just over the years really kind of push down the rates that advertisers are willing to pay to actually access those viewers. And so we need to find ways to actually increase the rates, keep them high, so that we can protect the diversity of opinions and keep getting them out there. Hi, everyone. So I'm in a unique position, I think, because I wear two hats. I've been blogging since 2006, personally. And then I also work at the FTC, where now we have a foot in monitoring what bloggers are doing online. So I can see the issue from both perspectives. What's most exciting for me um, is the access that blogging gives you. You have access to people, opportunities, um, organizations, and things that you may never otherwise have. So I see um, blogging as really closing the gap between people you might never be able to reach out to before. Um, you can do it through your blog, you can do it on Twitter, you can do it on Facebook. So that's been really amazing for me that I've seen. I think the challenge is for people to understand and also for agencies like the FTC to help people understand is what laws and rules people still need to follow while they're online. Um, sometimes I think people think the internet is kind of a free for all, um, but there still are rules of the road that you need to know about and follow. So that's a challenge that I'm seeing. Well, 
Uh, you know, I want to echo a lot of everyone's sentiments. The access, it's great. You know, Facebook has 500 million users. Uh, you know, from your country, would be uh, the third largest in the world. So obviously, you know, that's that's a huge opportunity there. Uh, audience, um, and I think what's really exciting is that when people hear Facebook, you know, you think of Facebook.com, but you know, there are so many other ways that Facebook enables connections among those millions of users. So whether it's on Facebook.com, whether it's on your iPhone, whether it's using mobile phone to text messages. You know, whether it's uh, doing something simple like creating a page on Facebook to promote your blog, um, you know, a lot of people are really worried. You know, you invest a lot of money in your, in your website and you have things like Facebook and Twitter and they're worried they're going to take the traffic away. We're actually now the number one referral of traffic to other websites. <coughs> so not taking away from it, you're actually driving more people to the content you're creating and, and letting them see that. Um, you know, and, and we've tried to, to make things simpler. So if you want to integrate social sites into your blog, you know, very simply, you know, it's now just something you can copy and paste a couple of lines of code. You don't need that much technical skill, and you can call, you know, add this whole social layer on top of what you're creating, and, and really relying on what the, what the true, I think, uh, really successful part of Facebook is is the connecting with your friends and people that you know. Um, you know, we have a lot of great technology, but the base concept of Facebook is still the connections between people, which is not something we created in Silicon Valley. That's been along for, around for as long as there have been people. So really just bringing that social element. And I think that the challenge is, uh, frankly, this is still very new. You know, we're, we're about six years old uh, as a company. Most of the internet companies in this space are, are fairly young. Uh, and people just need to get out there and try. Uh, and things, you know, there's no manual we can give you that says here's the three things you absolutely will do and succeed 100%. You know, a lot of the great creative things that have happened are, are good, but there's so many more that haven't even been tried. So a lot of it is just an encouragement to understand that this is a new space where you can really kind of pioneer uh, some of the things that are happening. Hello. I would say the most exciting is the money and business aspect. Just keep it real. The money aspect is great. Um, I think that, and just to be more politically correct, I think that it's great and super exciting that finally, especially such a small group like a young black professional audience can finally own and have their own thing, whatever it is that you want to say or do, and you own that and you put it out there in the atmosphere to multi-millions of people all over the world. What else can we do with that? Like, no, there's no other venue that even allows for you to do that other than the internet. So finally, like with my site, which is called Young, Black, and Fabulous, for those of you that were wondering why it's good for, finally, I, can, I don't have to rely on eOnline or, or um, people.com or some mainstream site that would affect and talk about black celebrities. We can finally take things in our own hands and do it for ourselves. And that goes for anybody. Anything that you're interested in, you can now do it yourself as opposed to waiting for a large company to help you out and tell you what you want to hear. So that's great, exciting, and utilizing, like we said before, utilizing your content for revenue is it's a challenge, but it's also so exciting. There's so many different ways to do that. There's incorporating it and finding different ways to incorporate advertisers and large mainstream advertisers into your content that it appeals to so that it appeals to your commenters and your readers. And we can integrate it in there, we can do different different just all different types of things that are exciting and fun for our readers that still make you money at the same time. So that's a great thing. And I think the negative mainly honestly from a business perspective, you're treated as you're a, you're a small business, but you're treated as a large business. So it's a very hard and great area that you're in where you have to keep everything small so that you sound like a blog. You stay your stay true to being a blog, you're not some big mainstream site, and so you don't want 50 million employees, you don't want all these different people, and you don't want all these different layers on your site, yet when you're making a certain amount of money and you have to follow FTC rules, um, there's just certain things that you have to do that are very taxing on a small business. So just finding that balance between following the large business rules and following all those things that come with that and still maintaining that small blog voice is just challenge. Yeah, and, and Natasha is a really great example of somebody who came up completely independent, like it's the Cinderella story, you know, <laughs> of, uh, of online that you can just start something and the people will come, and the people come, and she's a huge force to be reckoned with if you're in the black space. I mean, I know at the root, um, you know, why it's a big deal if we get a link from YBF, you know. Um, you know, she's she's got tons of uh, she's got a huge audience and she's a force to be reckoned with now. And you know, it's really it's it's one thing to for it to come from like a, a mainstream company like the Washington Post that already has uh, already has 
establish relationships with advertisers. And, and they're already, the company's already considered a, 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 a legitimate news organization. Um, but it's, it's, it, it's something else and something really sweet to really just kind of make that come up on your own. So it's, it's really inspiring. Um, I talked a little bit about my what I think is exciting about it. I'm just going to throw a couple of quick things out there, and then we're going to definitely hear from you guys in, in, in the uh, audience. Um, one thing I think about is this ongoing issue of the digital divide. Um, it's something that we don't talk about as much. Um, there are um, many people who just don't have access at all who are not part of this conversation at all. Um, I think about, uh, you know, there have been some studies that uh, came out last year about Twitter and that talked about the segregation online and how a lot of the social inequalities and the, basically the social networks that exist in the real world are replicated on Facebook and on and Twitter. So. All your, most of my friends are black on Facebook, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and so there, there isn't as much uh, integration online as, you, as there is the opportunity uh, for there to be. And so there's also this issue of, um, you know, sort of ghettoized space that are not respected as a market, as a real market. And, um, you know, so I mean, there's just the, the whole issue of segregation is something that I think about a lot, um, uh, just, you know, being affiliated with the Roots for the last couple of years. So, you know, I think about, um, you know, what are the, what are the implications of that? And with that, uh, I'd love to hear from people in the audience. I had a question uh, in regard to the uh, YBF versus Jet Magazine <coughs> paradigm. I guess you have the traditional media being kind of linked to the game in terms of uh, blogging and, and, and providing up to the minute celebrity news and information and also uh, in your perspective on where Jet may go or Ebony or Johnson Publishing in and of itself, how, how you feel about competing with them for the ghettoized space of black women who read celebrity news while they're at work? For one, I'll call it the ghettoized space. <laughs> Just because we're black focused, not being ghetto, but I mean, I'm sorry, honestly, media takeout. I do media takeout. Yeah. Okay. So I honestly don't compare myself to other people. And I don't compare myself to mainstream. I, I personally call Ebony and Jack mainstream. Not because they appeal to a large audience, meaning white, black, Asian, everything, but more because they're a, an established company that decided to take it online. There's a total difference between that and starting ground up by yourself with no name, no brand, no revenue, no money. You have zero dollars that you're starting with on this side. So it's just two different things. I just don't think we're in the same lane. But the funny thing is people always throw us in that same lane, yet the people who started from the ground up with no name behind them, no nothing, surpass these mainstream people every day. And it's, once again, it comes back to that feel of if you're gonna be a blog and if you're going to be an online presence, be a blog and be an online presence. You can't be a blog and be run by 50,000 anonymous people with all these mainstream and corporate brands and aspects behind you. It just doesn't translate to the audience. If the audience wants to come read a blog, they're reading one person's opinion and they're reading a certain, a certain feel and a certain take that they're getting from that site. That's why they come to that site. Whereas Ebony and Jet, they, they pretty much just put their magazine online. So it's, it's just a total different feel, it's a total different interaction. There is no interaction with a site like that, but with mine there is. That was, a, 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 I'm sorry, but also the mobile aspect of it, and mm -hmm. how you plan on transitioning, or if you have transitioned to like, right. content. Right, we've right. definitely had mobile for years, since the second year I was up, and I've been up for five years. Um, and mobile advertising is something that's becoming a very big thing, and we focus on, we now have catered mobile ad advertising, which is not just your ads are on your site translating to the, to the phone, it's actually ads that are catered directly for iPhones, Blackberries, things like that. So they look a certain way, they get a higher click-through rate and a higher percentage and a higher, you know, amount of money that you can get from it. So we definitely move into the mobile space, which I'm not sure sites like Ebony and Jet have done, but mobile and mobile shopping and mobile e-commerce is taking over. So we definitely have to pay attention to that. Yeah. A follow-up to your question. Um, why the F versus Boston? I'm kind of asking as an audience, have you seen that when you talk about this stuff? Is, are you 
for a competitor of theirs, a peer, and then to what end? Because it sounds exciting, I, I haven't looked a lot, but is it just, is it just keeping track of the celebrities or movie um, brands? Or I personally don't read other black gossip sites. I don't I don't have time. I mean, I'm almost a woman, woman show. I have a lot of help in other areas, but it's very difficult to read 50 million other sites that pop up after you. Um, there's no reason we already are keeping up at, up to the minute ourselves. There's no reason to pay attention. So I'm not really sure what they do on their end. I just know what YBF's voice is, and I know that I stick to that no matter what. It's not We're not run by traffic. If no one wants to come or 50,000 people want to come, I'm gonna be the same person. I had one reader day one through, you know, through year one. So I didn't even know that, th that this, what we have here, and the fact that we even have a panel here, I had no idea it was really possible. So I don't get to take everything like that. Congratulations, I, I was just curious if you have a sense of competition so now. I Other blogs probably do, but I don't I don't look at it. Become, I have competition with myself and trying to get the best advertising and the most money. <laughs> <laughs> right, I have a couple of questions for you. The first one is, how did you, um, how do you get sources for a lot of the articles? Because I noticed like some blogs have sources like before you even hear about it in the mainstream media, mm -hmm. and they're like so far ahead of the game in terms of you know competition with the mainstream. Media. It has so many more resources. So that's the first question, and then the other question is, how did you, how do you build your audience base? How did you go from a small audience to a I have no clue how I built the audience. I'm still trying to figure that out. I would do it more if I knew. It's completely grassroots. I've never, not a day of my life, taken out an advertisement online, print, anything. I've never paid money for advertising. I don't know. I started with my roommates, my four roommates, my mom and my grandmother, and my boyfriend at the time. They used to read all the time. <laughs> no clue that other people, and so literally everybody, about a year later, I would just, I went to law school and then my law school classmates were like, you run YBF? I'm like, how do you even know about YBF? So it, it literally was word of mouth and that's such, it shows you exactly how powerful the blogosphere is, how many people it reaches on its own. Um, and for the first part of your question, I'm sorry, what was the it's general? The sources. Oh, the sources. Well, of course I can't remember my sources, but um, <laughs> we definitely use sources. You have, I know for me, and I'm not sure how other sites operate, but for me, I have a certain certain set of sources that I go to. If you've proven yourself to me over the past five years I've been doing this, I don't have to keep asking all these factual questions to figure out if you're telling the truth or not. But I do research every single tip that comes to me. I research the fact size of it, and I research, you know, like if you're telling me you saw Shaquille O'Neal cheating with some woman in the Mandarin Oriental Hotel here in DC a certain weekend. I'll call the Mandarin to see if, any, if he even checked in. I'll find out if he had a game that would even prevent him from being there. So different factual things that you have to check and I mean no one's ever going to reveal their sources but nine times out of ten I always have the right information and it's done before it even reaches mainstream. I'd like to just pivot here for a second because um, that's one of especially in the black space um, you know celebrity and that's sort of a tug I actually want to get um, Crystal um, back in here there's a real tug because the, the Beyonce pictures they will get clicks all day long Less difficult, I mean, less easy is um, engaging uh, people in political coverage and, you know, proving to advertisers and audience in general that there is, uh, you know, because she's been, because BASA, YBF, um, gosh, all of them that I read all day long, you know, because, they're so, because they've been so successful, it, it, uh, it makes it difficult for the, um, you know, to prove that there is an interest in the other. So could you talk a little bit about uh, you know, non non celebrity news and how you build an audience doing that. Right. Well, so so to two points to pick up on the issue of sources. I mean, I think you have to define a source based on what audience you're trying to serve. What's your niche? Like, what is the win for you? For me, the win is. Um, to establish relationships with uh, people who are interested in the same things that we're interested in, right? It's also a win for us to be able to uh, leverage our property in a way that promotes good political coverage, right? So that's kind of where we develop our sources from, people who are interested in good political coverage, um, you know, and just reaching out. But it takes a lot, I think, um, of legwork, you know, on our part, because it's not as easy to say, hey, Beyonce's on my site. Beyonce's not here at the Black Political Club, right. you know, it's like, so it's like, okay. Um, so it takes a lot of research. It takes reaching out to offices of elected officials. It takes reaching out to civil rights leaders. It takes, you know, getting on your grind, finding out what's going on, 
in your communities. We're really fortunate with our staff because we have folks all over the country. And so even in terms of like our state and local penetration, we're able to find out what's going on in Atlanta, what's going on in Chicago, what's going on in DC, wherever we are, because we have um, that kind of on the ground hustle going, which I do think is probably key to establishing um, you know, that initial feel for your audience, right? Um, I would also say that to, to the point of, you know, audience loyalty in a subject matter like politics, some people like politics, some people don't. If you don't like politics, you're probably not going to come to Politics 365. If you're not interested in having um, dialogue beyond uh, fashion, celebrity, sports entertainment, you know, so there is a bit of a tension there. At the same time, you know, we are mindful of cultural trends, right? And so there are plenty of times where you have a crossover where, like, yeah, there's a celebrity, talk about, um, you know, Kevin Powell, right, recently, who was defeated by Congressman Towns in, you know, their primary um, on Tuesday. You know, that was a case of where you had somebody with celebrity, you know, who's up against, a, you know, a staunch politico. And so you just, you know, you counter that and you get to explore different content opportunities based on, you know, what do you think your audience wants, but also how are ways you can expand and grow. And I'm curious, Stacey, um, you sound like you're like a story waiting to happen. If, you know, the FTC lawyer is also a blogger. Can you, can you tell us what your blog is and what the subject matter is and how you... Um, <laughs> sure. So, I'll start out by saying what I'm supposed to say at the beginning of every time I speak, which is, the views expressed here today are my own. <laughs> <laughs> and don't reflect those of the commissioner and the individual commissioner. So, now that I said that, um, I am a story waiting to happen. I did have to get clearance from my job to make sure that I could do what I do. So I started out blogging with two um, co-bloggers. We both we all went to law school together, and we started MamaLaw.com because we were three moms who were lawyers trying to navigate life. And from there, it really took off. Um, so almost five years later, we have a company, Mama Law Media Group. We have three different ventures underneath that. One of them, the biggest one being the Blog Delicious Weekend Conferences. So it's, a, it's the only conference that celebrates diversity in social media and it's for women bloggers of color. And last year was our first year and it was through the roof success. We had no idea anybody would show up and we sold out and we had great sponsors. Um, and this is our second year next month in Miami, October 8th and 10th. So everybody is welcome and invited. Um, did you so, say it's Mamalicious? Mamalaw.com <laughs> is our parenting blog. Okay. And then blogaliciousweekend.com is the conference. Um, M-A-M-A-L-A-W. So, and then we also have, because we started getting a lot of um, coverage from the conference, brands started approaching us saying, we really want to market to your community. We don't know how to reach them, which we thought was kind of you know, crap because bloggers, black bloggers are everywhere, diverse bloggers are everywhere, but we said, okay, if you can't find us, we'll help you find <laughs> us. So we started the B-Link Marketing Network. And so if you're a brand and you need to get your products in the hands of Latino, African American, Asian American, whoever, um, we will connect you. It's sort of like a matchmaking service for the brands and bloggers. Okay. So that's just an example of, you know, all of the opportunities available um, through blogging. Okay, can I just ask you to switch your hat again yeah. to the FTC side? Yeah. This is something that I've had no idea about. I have a friend who's a blogger for the least of the Yeah, Natalie? Really? Yes, Natalie. Yes. She spoke last year about the Oh, she did. Okay, well, she, we went to Howard together. So anyway, she was telling me a lot about the, that there was, I had no idea that this payola issue was big, particularly with the mommy bloggers, but apparently yes. Apple was like flying them out to... California, giving them free laptops, and, and you know, and so they're like, ooh, I love my new Apple. And, and you know, if you're just a, a viewer, you're just you're reading the blog, you have no idea. It's like a paid, uh, you know, it's like a paid placement. And so the FTC has, has gotten involved in, in some of those things, which I had no idea. It seems like how can you even begin to try? I mean, everyone in this room could be getting paid all that, and nobody would ever know about it. So how do you? How does the FTC enforce the rules? And, and what are some of the general rules? Sure, I'll give you a quick background. So it's a great question and it's true. So now, um, as magazines are kind of dying, as um, advertising on television and other mainstream avenues are becoming more competitive, um, companies are trying to find new and creative ways to advertise to you. And so with bloggers, um, it's a no-brainer for them. They can contact a blogger and say, we'll give you a free, you know, whatever, iPad, if you write about it. 
And so if you're a blogger who doesn't really have a name yet, that's a great opportunity for you. You'll say, sure, I'll take it. You'll write a great thing about it. Um, and so we've seen a huge, a huge growth in that. Um, the FTC is the nation's consumer protection agency. Um, that's part of what we do. We have a competition side as well and an economic side as well. So, but the, cover, the consumer protection side, we are here to protect the consumers in commerce. So a big part of that is advertising. We want to protect consumers from deceptive and unfair advertising practices. So if someone is writing about an Apple laptop that they got for free and saying how great it is, um, and their reader doesn't realize that they got it for free, um, that is deceptive. Because as the reader, you might run out and buy an Apple laptop based on the positive endorsement that was made through the blog. And so the FTC wants to protect consumers from being um, misrepresented to. And so our, our big statute is the FTC Act, and that gives us authority to um, enforce unfair and deceptive practices. Now, in order to help business and also consumers navigate the FTC Act, we issued a set of guidelines back in the 80s. And those were called the Endorsement and Testimonial Guidelines. And so those told people what you can and cannot say when you're making an endorsement or giving a testimonial online. You know, back then in the 80s, the big things were infomercials and weight loss products, and you had everyone, and in the cold, everyone saying how great a certain weight loss product was. Um, and the consumer may, may or may not know that they are paid to do that. So those were the first um, version of the endorsement guides, if you will. This past December in 2009, um, we updated those endorsement guides to include examples that apply to social media. And that's where a lot of the coverage, you know, saying FTC is going after bloggers, that's where that came from. So if you're not going after bloggers, to be clear, these guides apply to everyone across the board, traditional media as well. And so the social media um, aspect of it says that you, if you were blogging, if you were Facebooking, if you were tweeting, wherever you are online, the same rules apply online as they do offline. So if you need to disclose um, offline, you need to disclose online too. So whether you're a mommy blogger getting a free product or a trip or a service, you have to disclose that to your readers and you have to disclose it right where you make the endorsement. It can't be small and hard to find. It has to be clear and conspicuous. That's our standard. Um, and the reasonable person, which is a hard standard to figure out what that means, but a reasonable reader of your blog has to understand that you were given some type of compensation to write that review. And so that's what we're how, So with. how do you enforce it? And are you, yeah, how do you enforce it? So, we, you know, it's a hard challenge. Um, we have been focusing our um, enforcement efforts on advertisers because we find that if you're a big company and you are using um, bloggers as part of your marketing campaign, then it's your responsibility to make sure that you tell them what they have to be disclosing and you have to monitor those endorsers to make sure that they're making those disclosures. So we are focusing our efforts on advertisers. That's not to say that bloggers don't have a responsibility, but we're focusing on that. So we just announced our very first settlement since the new guides came out. It was announced two weeks ago. Um, it was against Reverb Communications, which is a PR agency, and they did um, PR for gaming apps for I iPhones. And they had um, employees at the company go onto iTunes in the store and post positive reviews for games um, of the clients of, of the PR firm. And so we opened an investigation, um, and we just settled with them two weeks ago. So. You know, we're going down that path, but we definitely have our feelers out in the space. Um, but we're going to focus on advertisers and their agents first. Yes, I have a question for Natasha and um, how did you How did you start getting advertisers? Like, I just started my blog about a month ago, and um, now I'm looking at possible to get some advertisement on the blog. And I'm, obviously, I want to start this small because my blog is very small right now. But how did you start um, your right. reaching out to advertisers? I actually don't reach out to advertisers. Mm -hmm. That's something else. I've never approached a company or asked them anything. Okay. They just come flooding in. Honestly, I think it was the right place, right time. There okay. was no one else in the, in the sphere that I was in mm -hmm. when I started. There were no other black gossip blogs. There was okay. no, this was not what it is now. Mm -hmm. It was five years ago. And I think that they saw, well, the smart companies saw there's a niche audience that we can't tap on a regular traditional basis. Now we can reach them immediately through this random girl that's running this site. So let me 
send her here, like, like she was talking about. I mean, movie studios will send you, I mean, everything, all expenses paid to go here and there, and you know, let me, I want you to come screen our movie and do this and do that. But um, yeah, so it, it really literally took off on its own, and once companies see that you have a certain audience, they're gonna come to you and say, hey, can you do this, can you do that, can you run this advertisement? And now I have a whole, you know, someone running my advertisements for me that do all the back end work for the invoices, the, all that, so it just happened on its own. Okay, so I think the key for average, to get an advertiser mm -hmm. is to build your audience. Oh, and yeah. to his question earlier, to build your audience, it's all about writing good content. And then they'll up. <laughs> and it sounds so like cliche, but it's true. Okay. It's, it's, it's very difficult though, mm -hmm. um, because there's tons of websites, mm -hmm. and advertisers see all these websites, they want to know they can make a relationship with you, mm -hmm. that they can place the ad, it runs properly, it gives them the right the right experience that they're looking for for their advertisers. So it's very difficult for a very small publisher to just get into the space and approach an advertiser. Mm -hmm. uh, there are businesses like my, my own, First mm -hmm. Media, mm -hmm. which um, does that for small publishers. Okay. So you, you would sign up with us and we would go out to <coughs> hundreds and thousands of advertisers and go into their ad agencies and put you together with several other websites. So we're, we're selling your site but we're also selling you together with dozens of other sites. Now, would it be to a certain, because my um, my blog is basically just like, pretty much like a one-stop shop. For people who do not like research like myself, or other mm -hmm. people here, and, 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 you know, we research, we go, that's what we do. Some people don't have the time, so mine's just like a one-stop shop. Right. Entertainment, fashion, everything from this area to New York. Yep. So now what I just focus on, say, like if I'm doing fashion, like this week I did a whole bunch of stuff about fashion week and fashion like out here in New York and in DC. Mm -hmm. Would I focus on boutiques, designer stores, yep. would I just kind of, you know, a little bit of everybody, since it's just like a one-stop shop type thing. So advertisers will pay a lot more when, when you have a very specific audience, okay. an audience that is interested in just something that's common to what they're okay. what they're trying to sell. It doesn't mean you know there's ways to, to do that. Some some bloggers that may have an, a, a a very broad content will split their blog up okay. into into sections okay. and sell each section separately. Uh, then the advertiser knows you know this particular section is the, is the exact audience I'm trying to reach, and that's when they pay more. Okay. Thank you. Question. Another thing, I'm sorry, another okay. thing you may want to look into is going for um, local advertisers or smaller companies. Okay. Um, getting access to a Procter & Gamble, a Coca-Cola, that's very difficult. Okay. There are people with many years of business that do that all day, every day, yeah. and have those relationships. Yeah, that's what I was thinking when we local here in this area, if I was looking to a local, like even like, like, like I did the whole fashion week thing, so like a local consignment store here, a local boutique. Right, company, exactly. Kind of but I follow, a, I live in D.C., and I follow a neighborhood blogger mm -hmm. and he often has advertisements from restaurants and stores in the neighborhood that he covers who are advertising directly on his site. Okay. He even has things like apartment buildings and things like that. So as a small business, as a small blogger, I would say that that's a really good place for you to start. Okay. If you are looking for branded advertising, I, I'm with David on this, yeah. you really need to consider an ad network okay. because an ad network really acts as the broker mm -hmm. to join you, the publisher, to the advertisers themselves because you don't have those relationships to get in the door. Mm -hmm. But a, an ad network does and they can get in the door and give the advertisers Advertiser access to way more eyeballs than you can do. Okay, thank you. And just to chime in really quickly, it still goes, even with the ad network, it still goes back to building your audience. Yeah. Because now there's so many blogs, everyone wants an ad network. I deal with six, and they go out and shop my site for me. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, now they're being so selective about which bloggers they want to work with because there are so many. Yeah. So unless you have a certain audience and a large audience, even if it's a small audience, it has to be a very powerful audience yeah. that will buy then they don't want to work with you anyway. So it's still at the base of it, building the audience and building your traffic. Okay, yes, which is what I'm working on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> um, this could go to anyone on the panel, but maybe more so to Crystal, maybe to Natalie, um, about smaller blogs and are they trying to become like the, the, the go-to blog for information and then how do you feel that even smaller blogs are affecting the credibility in journalism itself and just what you all are trying to do at, at your blogs? Well to the point of you know the credibility of journalism I think 
the content that appears on your site is what's ultimately going to determine how credible you are, right? Um, at a certain point, if you go to a site, this is one of my pet peeves, if there are a lot of typos, if I know, if you're saying something that's exactly contradictory to what I'm reading elsewhere, you know, so I mean, there are, there are a number of items that you can look to to determine, okay, is this going to be a qualified source? And with your, you know, the pattern of content development, it relies on, you know, consistency over time. Do you prove time after again? Yes, they're a reliable source. It's well written. It's clear. It's easy to understand. So I mean, I think that's how you prove um, your journalistic integrity. And you know, I think that links to the second part of your question, which is, you know, how do you transition towards becoming a, a reputable media source? And you know, it takes time. Just like CNN wasn't built in a day, the Washington Post and the Root weren't built in a day. It takes time to to you know define your audience, define your voice, and to make it clear, hey, we have a position, we have a perspective, and we're going to maintain that standard of quality writing, quality journalism over the duration of our um, existence. Yeah, and I'd like to just acknowledge Eric Easter who just came in. He, uh, he was a, he's also been in the space for a long time. He was with WashingtonPost.com, and then also we, Jet just came up, so he was most recently from uh, Ebony Jet, and we were just talking just to catch you up about you know, what the difference is between, like, how do traditional brands like the Washington Post or Ebony, how do they, uh, I guess, how they interact or how they compare to newer blogs like the YBF or Boston. And, you know, the one thing that Ebony Jet had and that the Washington Post has is they have that time that they've put in to build that credibility. So, you know, once you have a brand that people, you've had a, you have a product that people have had in their living rooms for generations. I mean, that's something that means something mm -hmm. online, or at least you hope that it, it does, that if that, that uh, emotional connection that readers have to your product, that it translates, you know, translates online. So, so how do you, like, if, or are you even trying to surpass them and say, well, you know, when people say, they wait till well, Fox said it or CNN said it, it must be true if, if they're looking online or something mm -hmm. like that. But do you want to be that? Of course you want to be, but how, what steps are you taking to be that? Go to what they said it, how 365 said it, so it must be true, you know. So one of the things we do, we try to generate a lot of original content that is not based on what everybody else is talking about. So we try to find opportunities to develop breaking news stories, which goes back to earlier. Um, when I mentioned, you know, establishing relationships with people who are servicing your niche, whether they're, you know, if you're interested in, uh, say, cooking, right? Mm -hmm. Who are the hot chefs in town? You know, where are the best culinary arts schools? Where are you going to get the best foodie experience? You know, so finding, you know, opportunities to say, hey, you know what? You have a story that you want told. I have a platform on which you can tell your story. How can we work together? And again, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not, it's not the celebrity phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, but it takes time to be able to say, you know, look, time after time and again, I can go to Politic 365 and I know I'm going to see something new on that site that I'm not going to see anywhere else. And because you have that journalistic credibility with you, it gives, you know, force and weight to what you're saying so that over time people are like, okay, yeah, I get it. So I know this is my breaking news site. Just like CNN may be your breaking news site for whatever else, MSNBC, again, a brand like that takes time to develop. And I know for me, I, I'll cut someone off quick, like, Vasa, you know, they've had some misogynistic, you know, they went misogynistic a couple, too many times, and I was like, you know what, I'm out, and I've never been back again. You know, Perez Hilton, same thing, you know, he's wishing for Britney to die, you know, I'm like, that's, I don't want to go to read that, you know, so, I mean, and the thing is, like, audiences are really fickle, so they could love you today, and then they just, they're out, you know, on, especially on the web, it's not something that lands at their doorstep or right. get in the mail or that's a physical thing on a newsstand. So you really have to, I mean, I, I think, I mean, at the root, we always sort of err on the side of caution. Like when Michael Jackson died, we didn't put that, I mean, we didn't even, we actually waited until the LA Times confirmed it, but TMZ ended up being the one that had the most accurate information. <laughs> <laughs> LA Times actually ended up being wrong in that right. case. But, you know, you just, you just do what you can to try to, uh, fact check and, and, and do as much due diligence as you can. Because the other thing about doing original content, the culture of the web, anybody can just take it, you know, and say, oh yeah, Politics 365 reported that such and such, you know, and so they're able to kind of co-opt your original 
material and in a way that, and that's just the way the culture of the web is. So. And, and I would just add, if you're waiting for a news feed to source, you know, one of the reasons there's such a space for blogs because of media cutbacks. So, you know, what maybe used to get a reporter, you know, sent out to cover something, you know, might not get a report anymore. So a blog can step in and fill that void and, you know, uh, at least then someone's covering what's happening there. You know, that's been one of the great opportunities uh, as well. I think that's true. And for example, that when Michael Jackson died, I remember I was on the Metro going home from work and I heard someone talking about it behind me. And I was like, what's going on? Is that true? I don't believe it. And so I'm not going to go to CNN. I'm not going to go watch the post. I went to Twitter because Twitter will tell me what's happening. Yes. And so I was immediately got the whole story from Twitter, you know, so Facebook, same thing. So it's, it's so interesting now that people who are not in mainstream media are the ones to break the story. Oh, yeah, that, that, yeah, the same thing with the discovery. Right, thing. exactly. You know, the, yeah. the first the most accurate report reports reporting. came, yeah, they came on Twitter. Yeah. Um, and actually, this actually goes to the question I have of Adam, which I'm um, echoing uh, Congressman Rush's question, or his, his observation that um, for those of you who came in late, he said that his prediction is that 50 years from now, these kids that are online telling all their business to everybody, they're going to try to change their name. Yeah. <laughs> They're just trying to divorce themselves from that whole, that whole situation. And, you know, and so that, that gets to the issues of privacy, which is, you know, um, which you deal with at Facebook. And could you just address that? Yeah, you know, I think technology always uh, has, has things that, that shift culturally. One of the things we're proud of at Facebook Sometimes you see it, privacy makes the press. You know, the, the philosophy is, you know, you should be able to control what you, should, you know, what you put on the web because you know people are going to put things in there. What kind of controls can we build in from the beginning that other sites may not necessarily give you? And I think you know this discussion comes up a lot in politics, where I, where I, I work a lot. You know, I used to be an opposition researcher. I know that this, these things are put around, but you know, it's also kind of. I think it's most shocking to people that this is new to for these. For folks that are growing up in it, when everyone has it, I, mean, I think in 20 years, it's also going to be a, a tremendous mark of authenticity. So I have to use an example of a politician's running for office 10, 15, 20 years from now, you know, you know, and he's got this opponent, and one of them has gone through and scrubbed his Facebook page so that all there is is, you know, three photos of him, you know, smiling and shaking hands and that sort of thing, and the other one is, you know, live their life, for, for better or worse, you know. I think this is going to increasingly become a mark of authenticity as we look for, you know, something online to, to differentiate what makes someone authentic, you know. With all the folks who may be, you know, endorsing things and, and you don't know about the full taste, you know, what do we look to for cues and society that, that, that. and they're you know evolving norms. There are things that disqualify people from being running for office 20, 30 years ago, 10 years ago that, that are no longer disqualifiers because society has adapted to I think new realities. So they you know we, we try and teach the message of, of control, of understanding the consequences. But you know I think at the same time while there will always be extreme cases, you know, as a whole, people are more comfortable with this. There's going to be a lot more of it. I don't think necessarily we'll look at this as just solely a bad thing. You know I think it is nice to look back and see there are photos of the entire life growing up. There are people you didn't lose track of, but there are certainly benefits. And I read a statistic the other day, I forget the number, but it's something like, you know, 80% of people who shut down their Facebook accounts end up coming back like, within a year because you can't. Oh, it's, it's, it's actually significantly higher. Right. right. <laughs> you think you don't want it, but you really don't. direct this to uh, Stacy Ferguson. I think because you work for a federal agency and you have a blog. Now you don't work for Internal Revenue, but that's what my question is about. Like, what, at what point does this become a tax situation? I mean, is when you get the, the first free whatever? Or <laughs> I will not attempt to answer that question, but I'll tell you that um, Shannon Nash, she specializes in tax tips for bloggers. And actually, if you go to the Blog Witches Weekend website, we have a webinar loaded on there of her explaining to you what you need to do. Because it is very surprising, and probably the threshold is lower than what you might think. Can you repeat that name? Sure, Shannon Nash. Shannon? Yes, she's a CPA um, in Georgia and the West Coast. She has two offices, and that's her specialty. When, when you work with um, an ad network, uh, the ad network, when they sell advertising, they'll send you a 1099 form, which represents... Or know, they should. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you do advertising, if you sell advertising on your own, you have to make sure the agency is sending you the 1099, etc. Uh, I just 
just have one more question about the limits of privacy in advertising, um, especially from Facebook, because you're selling our information. It's not like you're. Well, and that's exactly that's a common misconception. But we actually we sell no personally identifiable information. And we said we don't, and we don't. You know, it's just. I mean, you show your shoulders, but it's the truth. You know, and at some point, you just. It's a fact that what we do is when you put things on your profile, you say like Green Day, we allow advertisers to come in and, and target ads to people who like Green Day, but we don't tell them that it's, you know, I don't know what you're doing, say your name is John, we don't tell them it's John who lives in Baltimore who likes this. We say, you know, there are 30,000 people who, who like Green Day and we can tell ads. Cool. Okay. No, no, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, you know, again, and there are a lot of companies that engage in tremendously, very, very deceptive behavior on the internet. Uh, Facebook has gotten a lot of criticism, but we clearly, explicitly, and legally say we don't we don't sell your information. Now there are plenty of places and, and folks on the internet who are, are not uh, held to that same high standard. But I do think this is a concern, and, and I think something people have to look at as they understand, you know, when you're monetizing the internet, these these are a lot of things that happen. We um, we work quite a bit with the selling advertising with an idea of what you may be interested in, but we do not have any personally identifiable information. We do not know, we don't have a database of names, of email addresses. Um, what we do is we will see that, you know, if you were on a, a political blog within our network, uh, we know you like politics. If you're on a, a cooking site in our network, we know you like cooking. And then we can serve ads to people that cook and hook, you know. It's, it's, um, what are the it, limits though? Like, what's the, outside of my name, what's the well, it's, like Adam said earlier, it's all about control, right? So if you don't put the information on your gauge, then they can't sell it. They've like changed 30 times how to control it, and they made it more difficult to control from the region. Again, so that, that actually has nothing to do with advertising uh, of what we did, and, and again, we, we've said that. You know, these are new spaces where I should be better. But look, the, the answer to your question is on Facebook, you know, we don't sell information. You know, it's a free service, so that by using Facebook, you are agreeing to let us serve you ads so we continue to have to be a free service. If you don't feel comfortable with that, you're obviously, you obviously, know, the, the choice is to not use Facebook because we at some point have to continue to exist as an entity. But more broadly, online, you know, there aren't necessarily clear standards. You know, beyond sites that are reputable like Facebook and Google and others, you know, there. There are clear standards, and, and there aren't, and I know this is something that, for instance, Congressman Rush's staff uh, spends a lot of time looking at and, and talking about. Um, you know, the, there's a very much a, a, a buyer beware there, so, you know, there's a lot out there, and the ones you spend a lot of time focusing on, you know, because we're big names, you know, are not necessarily the ones that are out there uh, really doing egregious practices. All right, I saw, I saw a Wall Street article, but mm -hmm. and, and then at the same time, what is the FC, FTC going to educate consumers about the, the limits of privacy and sure we have we have an entire division devoted to consumer and business education so if you go to ongaronline.gov there's a there's a module on there about social networking websites and how to protect your information on those so it's ongaronline.gov i think there's a bookmark out front that you can take that has the list of all of our our consumer ed websites um, and also we have an entire division of privacy protection so we have attorneys working um, to protect consumers. Is it, is it exclusively a federal um, area of litigation? Or is it, I don't think so. No. So statewide, states, individual states, do you all have to comply with that as well in terms of Facebook? Uh, so, I mean, it, it will depend state by state and law by law, but, but yes, generally, uh, you know, we're going to have different things. But I, I think there's, there's something important that bloggers should be able to take away about the privacy issue. And in order for companies to sell advertising on, on your sites, um, it's important to have the ability to sell at different levels. Uh, the most common type of ad sale might be a brand sale, which is exactly about the, the visitors to your site targeting the content on your site. But then there's what's called behavior advertising, which may understand that so-and-so visited a car site in the past, and when they come to your site, you can sell a car ad on that spot, site using using ad networks, and you get paid a lot more money when uh, there is more information about the audience on your site. You will get paid more money. So it's it's an important issue for bloggers to understand, and it's also important for consumers to understand. So the industry is getting together and really trying to tackle this issue and provide information to consumers as to as to what we're doing and how to opt out or how to participate in the end. Who are some of the leaders in the industry that are more consumer friendly? 
Well, I, I think, you know, I, I like to think my company is first. Um, there's companies like ValueClick, even Google is, is participating in here. Um, Yahoo, 24-7. Um, a lot of the big names, and, and people don't know who these companies are because they're, they're behind the banners um, a lot of the times. Uh, oh. Yeah, and as, as, as somebody from like old media, as I worked at the Washington Post um, newspaper uh, for a long time, the thing that has struck me about this new space is how powerful advertisers are. I mean, they, you know, I mean, <laughs> they really get to dictate a lot of what, um, you know, what the content. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it brings up all kinds of ethical issues, you know, around the, you know, what we were talking about with. Um, you know, companies giving free promotions, but it also like you again. You sort of wonder who's leading who, you sure. know. And I mean, who's is it? The advertising is, is sort of leading the discussion. Or is it the like, individual who's, who's leading the discussion? So anyway, there was another question. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. um, the question is. What is the relationship between Google and the bloggers? Because it looks like Google try, has kind of, Google's trying kind of rating blogs. So what's that relationship between Google and bloggers? Um, uh, uh, Google has a blogging product called Blogger, so you do have to wonder, uh, you know, to what extent, you know, they're, they're using that. But, but they're, they're also probably the largest provider of sales to bloggers too, ad sales. You know, they have their AdSense product, which is those text ads that you typically see. So they're actually providing a lot of money to the bloggers. But I think probably that's more concerning to a typical blogger is Google controls how much traffic your blogger blog gets. You know, luckily Facebook is, is there are competitors that come into the field over time, and Facebook clearly is as well, providing traffic to people's blogs. So as advice to a blogger, I would understand where your traffic is coming from. Um, if your traffic is entirely coming from, from Google, um, you should think about that because you know, that means people find you from searching. They're not finding you from bookmarking or for, you know, hopefully, it, they, they want to, you want them to enjoy your content and you want them to come back on their own, not through Google. Sorry, not through Facebook. Well, <laughs> but but you, want it, you want people to come to you directly, and that's important. And, and, and when, when people are ranking the content, it's both good and bad. It's also what might drive your first visitor to you as well. So. My question that dovetails what he said, this is kind of, I'm just thinking about this philosophically, it may sound odd. One of my frustrations, I'm trained as a journalist, I really love facts, even if I even if they're not comfortable, I really like accuracy. And it's stunning to me how many people are reputable character in these positions in life, regardless of race or class, just flat out lie. There's a lot of this in there. A lot of it is perpetuated on the internet. And censorship. You know, I'm against that. So, you know, it's like the wild, wild west out there. Might there ever be, maybe it might come from Facebook, you guys are big, or someplace, where you kind of have, like, um, you can start this product lines about the good house, you can you know, just a little accurate, you know, own, own commentary from facts. Because when you add the, the lack of misinformation and how people make decisions based on misinformation, and then I'm sorry, I'm, I'm seeing dreadful data about our educational system. And there's a new documentary I can't wait to go see to see how not so bright many of us are. This is like scary. This is not, I'm not that old. This is not the American I'm loving. So it's kind of, as, as much as I love media, people are taking this incredible power and just totally leaving some people who are extraordinarily gullible off the freaking cliff to their detriment. And it's just an issue that I have. Like Congressman said, someday some people may be writing some things right now that 10 years from now you want to disown. Some people will probably make decisions right now based on so-called reputable sources that they live to regret. And it just makes it sound very Pollyannish, but it's my issue. Well, it's, I mean, it's definitely happening because that's with uh, Sherrod. You know, there was well, that, there you go. You know, she that did not have to happen if right. somebody bothered to check some facts. 
And I mean, I think we hit on a couple of really key issues. One is not only we find misinformation, sometimes you come up against wholesale disinformation campaigns. You know, where people are either willfully ignorant of the facts or they just don't care what it is and so they'll fabricate the truth. And hey, you know what? If I have enough people who agree with me, regardless of how wrong I am, other people are like, oh yeah, that must be the truth. So I mean, there's that. But you know, I think part of what is going to happen, you know, up to this point, the internet has been the wild, wild west. You know, we love it because we, we could say what we want. I have the right to say whatever I want to when I want to. Okay, but really? Do you have to share that with the world? And, you know, I think as we grapple with that, you know, you're going to see things changing. You know, like we have the FTC rules. Um, you know, you have um, even to the question of privacy, right? Privacy, security, whatever. You know, yeah, any of these issues, you know, it's like, first, there requires a real education, you know, a consumer education. Like you talk about the net neutrality issue. If you ask everybody in this room, we will each have a different opinion about what it is, what it means, you know, and it's like, you have to start with the facts somewhere. So I mean, there has to be a movement towards reality and a balanced assessment of what's at stake. Yeah, I just want to follow up on the case point, just stop. My boss is sponsored a bill called HR 45. It's, uh, the, it's a, there's, a, there's a VIN number, vehicle ID, it, it seeks to simply register every gun, chain of custody. Bought a gun 10 years ago, you throw it in the, you know, just follow that little gun around, who owns it? Law enforcement kind of like that. There are, and then I have a service where I can see who's writing about them and all of that. There are a whole litany of gun-related um, blogs and magazines who I kid you not, aside from lying about what that bill purports to do, we're not against, I mean, just register a bleeping gun. Now the thing is, we have won, and they're fundraising about it. They said, we have won, they didn't beat us back. They lied, and, and there's a whole lot of, you know, we're talking about politicians not stand up for this stuff. But now it, it's like, they, they put out their stuff online, and a lot of this stuff is really legitimately written, and they're lying about the law. It seeks to register, not take away, not say, you could have a whole freaking arsenal. Get a number. And they lie, and, and what, 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 what bugs me is that there's a whole lot of people, there's a huge population, that believes everything in that. And they're congratulating themselves for A, lying to you, B, allegedly beating back the law, and C, let's do it again, Casey, we introduce it. Well, and none of that stuff is true. Yeah, I, I think that that's where media literacy um, should come in, and, and it, you know, it's really important to incorporate that into to literacy literacy, <laughs> because um, there isn't really a way to stop people from lying. And you know, all you can do is create more critical thinkers or instill uh, critical thinking in people and uh, you know teach kids to not believe anything that they see. I mean, my son's pre-K teacher, I remember him doing a whole media literacy thing, talking about don't listen to what's on the radio, you know, like, don't believe it just because they say that, don't believe it, you know, hearing my son repeat that back to me. You know, it's really important that that happens because, I mean, you can't control it. You know, FTC, I mean, yeah, well, I'd like, good luck with that. It's <laughs> only, we're only, you know, we only have authority in commerce, so if it's right. just freedom of speech. Yeah, that's it's freedom of speech. And people lie about commerce, commerce too. too. On the whole, people attacking blogs and going off and saying that all we do is lie and all these things. Honestly, you're not going to be able to change what an advertiser, what a blogger, what any of those people do. They're plain and simple, money hungry people, a lot of people that internally just have no morals and just don't have a moral compass. You can't change that. I can name several sites that have no moral compass because they don't care. And you cannot allow the FTC to control it because if that was the case, they would be shut down a long time ago. They pick and choose who they want to shut down and that it is what it is. I've seen it with my own eyes. So instead of attacking them, take personal responsibility and focus on people and telling them, giving them the media literacy we're talking about and saying, this is a blog and this is what this means. You do not take this as fact. I even have a disclaimer on my site, unlike other sites, and I say, what is, this is, I'm not claiming anything as fact, even though I know it's right, but I'm not going to claim it as fact because I know. I, I purposely stay away from certain stories. I don't report deaths unless it's already reported by a credible journalistic source. There's two completely different things between a blog and a journalistic source. So when people start looking at blogs and say, oh, I'm going to believe everything they say, and they get mad at the blog for being wrong, it's a blog. You know, it's a journal, it's not a journalistic entity. So you have to look at those journalistic entities who also, I mean, matter of fact, lie themselves and have been lying for years. So you can't just say, oh, CNN won't tell us the truth or LA Times tell us the truth. They've been distorting the truth since day one as well. But if you want to pick them as a journalistic entity, that's fine, but don't ostracize and blast 
certain people for doing what they do, but they're going to do it anyway. We have to take personal responsibility if we really want to change the problem and fix the problem. And to the extent you see deception and unfairness, um, you know, in commerce with businesses uh, and marketing, then let the FTC know because that's where we can do something. Do y'all think there's an evolving standard for the First Amendment in regards to now that the internet has, has been presenting so many uh, uh, issues in regards to freedom of speech and, and defamation and whatnot? Do you think there's an evolving standard that, that needs to be created? Because they create these tests out of nowhere. And then we, we, we have to deal with them. But do you all think that like, if you could, would, we, would there be a different test? Would there be a, a lower standard? or a higher standard, I guess you could say, for people that are, are, are defaming others or, I mean, I, I mean y'all <laughs> I'm not gonna speak on defamation or First Amendment, mm -hmm. I mean, to the First Amendment issue, I think that, I don't know who was, who's gonna do it, but I think that, you know, we might see at some point um, an attempt at enforcing First Amendment protections. You know, like the First Amendment is fine as it is. Obscene conduct is not covered under the First Amendment. You know, hate words not covered under the First Amendment. So a lot of the things that you see um, taking place, not on all blogs, but in some places where you just have like this hateful invective going on, if they were actually held to what the First Amendment standard is, you would see, you know, enforcement action, but the question is, who's going to do it? You know, is it, are we going to create a new government agency? You know, like the FTC is busy, the FCC is busy, you know, if you, like, bring in the Justice Department, they're busy, so how are you going to enforce that standard? And part of what I think goes back to, you know, we've mentioned a couple times this notion of getting consumer, um, consumers actively involved, like, educating ourselves about what it is. Like, we can, you know, rage against the machine, too. You know, we can fight back. We can say, you know what? We're tired of people talking all these falsehoods. How can we change it? We each have equal power and force to say whatever you want to online. So, I mean, there's going to have to be a combination of solutions, but if you wait on the government, you know, you, you're going to wait for a while. And, and when the government comes, you're, they're, when you're publishing, you're going to have to understand what all the rules and regulations are for posting you know, anything. So if, if, if laws start to be created about what, what you're allowed to post on your blog, that's going to be a hurdle into how easy it is to publish. I think some of the negativity online is something you just have to be uh, prepared for being in the black web space. You know, after Skip Gates was arrested, after that whole thing, um, we got some of the most hateful uh, comments. And people used to always, I mean, there was so much that we didn't have enough of a staff to, to keep up with it all. I mean, we had people, some, somebody figured out how to post a YouTube of a lynching, you know, on the room, which it was horrifying, you know, it was terrible. And, you know, it's something about this, the web, I mean, I think that things that people would not say in real life. The anonymity of it. Yeah, it's the anonymity, so there's this, you know, and that's, I mean, that's also one of the problems that, you know, I, I'd like to talk, ask the panel about is, you know, how do you, how do you avoid sort of this disembodied feeling? Um, you know, how do you, how do you use the web to, um, you know, encourage real life interaction? So uh, one of the things that we do at Facebook that differentiates us from most sites is we just, you can only have one account and it can only be in your real life. And if it's anything else, we'll shut it down. Um, and, and this does a couple of things, and so that, you know, a lot of people now can see uh, Facebook isn't just on Facebook.com, but in other places. And one of the most interesting places is uh, when you use Facebook and require a Facebook account to leave a comment on a blog or, or a news site or whatever it may be, uh, so all of a sudden it goes from anonymous and everything to your picture and your name and a link to your profile, so all of a sudden what you're saying is actually linked to something, uh, you know, as simple as, as your name and a photo, and, and um, you know, we don't from the companies that have told us that have integrated it, they've just seen the level of, you know, you're never gonna get rid of the level of, you know, of, of all craziness on the internet. It's just impossible. But they said, you know, reducing that anonymous aspect really did take it down several levels and make it, uh, you know, a little bit more tolerable. Because, you know, people are, are willing to say things anonymously. And there, there should, it needs to be anonymous spaces on the web, but it doesn't need everything on the internet does not need to be anonymous. And so it's interesting to see how that's had an effect on places like some of the news sites and blogs that have integrated it. Point of fact, <coughs> if the anonymity is needed, there is no such thing as police when it comes to crime because a web footprint and ability can be trapped to you, as I understand.
say it. Am I wrong? Um, it, it depends, but there are a lot of cases where, where um, you know, they figured out what your IP address was, they went to the yeah. internet service provider, yeah. they, you know, it, it can't be done easily. You have to do it with law enforcement and you have to go all the way up the chain to all the companies and, and get all the information. Um, so it, it's very hard for a single company to do it, but it can be done by the government. So there are maybe preventative things to happen just about <laughs> <laughs> and, and if I can interject, cell phones, right? They're uh, even more of a, a precise locator. So uh, we're, we're going to take three more questions uh, and uh, then we'll uh, wrap it up, ask the panel to uh, provide closing remarks. Yeah, there, there's a wealth of talent here, people, um, and perspectives. I am currently a PR professional, and I wanted to know how can we explain to our clients how important these blogs are, and how 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 we can reach, especially AA blogs, who we find it hard to explain the return on on the investment to our clients. From my vantage point, it's about defining the relationship, right? You're targeting niche audiences, right? You're not going to say Politic 365, YBF serves all people at all times, but you're going to be able to speak to the unique community that each of these sites is able to represent and bring in. And you have to understand, like in African American communities in particular, we are relationship consumers. You know, it's like if I want a product, I'm going to get that product because not, you know, I have a relationship with that product line, not just because, oh, that's a neat device. You know, like, why is Nike so popular? Because you have a relationship with Nike. And so, I mean, I think that's really the key in describing the value of um, African American sites is saying, look, you're dealing with a niche community here. There's a specific audience. Who do you want to target? You want to tar target mommy bloggers? Great. Look at this entire community. You can reach every single black mommy blogger across the country with this network here. So you have to sell the relationship, not just the one time, um, you know, the one time, you know, how many clicks you're going to get. Like, okay, well, we're going to get 15 million, maybe not. But you're getting the relationship, a long time consumption strategy. And I know you touched on it, um, Dollar, when you said that, you know, they lump them into, you know, the general market and, you know, trying to reach these consumers. It's, it's kind of hard to always try to convince these large companies that we work with to return on their investment because, you know, the consumer is out there. Um, it's that niche market that you're looking for. Well, I think um, in particular with the African American audience, African Americans are super consumers. Um, we see this on television, just in terms of the amount of television that's watched versus other audiences. We see this digitally, like with cell phone usage. So the digital divide certainly exists, but uh, black people on cell phones are really using those phones to access the internet, which is helping to close the divide because while you may not have a computer and internet access at your house, you have a phone, a smartphone, and you're accessing the internet there. And so it's really about people being super consumers. This goes into actually uh, purchases. And so we just make more purchases based on our total income levels. And so we're super consumers across the board. And I think that convincing companies of that and showing them real <coughs> data to show that and to prove that helps them to get there so that they can actually work. And I think also the, the African American market is also uh, the trend setting market. You know, and um, so we're the what is early adopters. Yeah, we're early adopters, and, and sort of a, I can't I can't think of the, the term that came out in this um, this study, but sort of like the trend leaders. You know, that we things that we adopt early, others follow, and in a way we have disproportionate influence um, in the culture in around the world. Um, so, you know, that's one thing that that's one way that you sell. Um, you know, you sort of sell, sell our audiences. I heard a new term also, I think now African American consumers are being referred to as multi influentials. Multi -influential. There are so many facets, so. Yeah. Pro Another question? Pro consumers. Pro consumers. Yeah. And yes, I wanted to ask anyone how are you. Want to get a mic? You are. Wow. <laughs> how are you reaching the. Um, I don't want to call myself senior citizen, but at 54, I'm probably the only one among my friends who knows what blog is. So, you know, and the young man that was asking about how to reach out to business people, 
how are you reaching out to people who are 54 and over, um, 85, they're still around and a lot of them are doing marathons and stuff. So how are you making sure that they're involved in this? And you know, we're, we're talking about business. A lot of us are blogging just for the fun of it. What, what do you think about that? Um, a blog is a, a lot of the times a niche audience. And we work with a couple of um, couple of blogs that are for the for the older crowd. Uh, uh, one site, thirdage.com, is a is a is a blog that we work with. And, but they target the, the senior crowd specifically. So, you know, I, I think in terms of taking a you, you don't want to take a blog that's that's reaching a young audience and try to, to change it to target an older audience because that makes it difficult to sell advertising. But if you have two separate blogs, one that goes after the older audience, then it's 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 more marketable. You can turn it more into a business. We recently at the FTC we had a brainstorming session as to you know what areas we should look at in the next five years. And seniors, sorry, <laughs> was at the top of the list because seniors are online and where people are, the scams will follow. And so um, there are certain scams that are more particularly targeted towards senior citizens. So it's something that we're very aware of and planning to do more. We take it to inboxes. But you know, we have an email subscription on our site, so for everything that we post on that day, it'll also be emailed to people who subscribe to us. And so, you know, one thing that's worked is like, if you convince somebody to come to the site once, sign up, you don't have to come back anymore. You deliver it right to your inbox, you know? So that's something else that works because a lot of times, you know, we have a senior population who's more likely to check their email than be searching the blogs all day. And so if I have that one hook, then that's how you can generate some interest there. At Facebook, we have the greatest hook of all uh, pictures of grandchildren, <laughs> <laughs> which is why uh, 35 plus, and particularly women over 55, are one of our fastest growing demographics. But you know, not all sites are going to have such a, a potent tool. <laughs> is there a way to block the parents on Facebook? <laughs> Adjust your private settings so they can't see everything. I'm gonna do that. Parents are everywhere on Facebook. Last two questions here. Yes, um, I I just want to uh, make a statement and I want to give kudos to uh, Facebook. Um, I'm not going to say my name for um, obvious reasons after I make my comments, and I'm going to ask that a lot of people come up and ask my name because you'll see probably in another 30 days. But I became a victim of a blog. It was one of the biggest lessons I probably had learned in the whole 60 years that I've been on the face of the earth. Um, I was hired as a VP Public Affairs for a major research university in, in this country. And uh, white guys were very upset about the salary. And so um, even though it's not the highest salary I've ever made, apparently they felt that someone of my ilk should not make that kind of salary. Um, I will tell you that within four days, my entire footprint in the internet changed um, because a blog hired an, uh, an artist who did a cartoon of me uh, basically sitting on a slave block with my name on the cartoon and saying that I had come wrapped in a governor's check and that's how I got this job. Um, that went throughout this country. Um, it probably caused me to cry more tears than I had ever cried in my life three years ago. And um, it just changed the first six pages of my name for about six months in Google, the first six pages had nothing to do with anything but my new position, my salary, and the governor I worked for. It was, and it was the big lie. None of it was true. I mean, I have 34 years in this business. But I did fight back, and ultimately, about a year and a half ago, I joined Facebook. And it's kind of fascinating because within, I would say, within six months, I had just about 2,000 Facebook friends. And many of them were folks who had commented on the cartoon on this political blog and telling me that they were sorry. Now, they had faces now, so I know who they are. But telling me that they were really sorry that they had participated in it, but they had believed it. So now they see photo albums of my children, 
Um, they know a lot about what I do during the day. They're, so I'm unveiling my political blog, uh, the 1st of October. Um, I already have thousands of people who are, uh, I mean thousands, it's like over 5,000 people who are waiting for the unveiling. But I give kudos to Facebook because you do have to put some photo up. I mean, even if it's the blank thing, but you got to do something so you can't just hit at people and hit at them. Um, I think that, if, if the closing comment is, I think that what gave me one of the best feelings of my life is that the artist who drew the cartoon of me um, actually came to me so that I could buy the original for $300, which I thought was a joke because my cartoon should be worth more than $300. <laughs> but number two, he did request me as his Facebook friend. And I think that the best feeling for me is to see that out there for years, that that friend request will always stay there. He will never be my Facebook friend. But it just makes me feel good to be able to deny that. So I thank you. For that. Well, I don't know if I'm going to go into that, but I guess I will. Um, just to kind of answer a question back there in the back. Um, I actually consult for a various number of nonprofits across the U.S. And one of the nonprofits that I consult for, their initiative is to bring about awareness to the, under, the underserved and unserved communities about the importance of technology. And when you spoke about um, seniors, for me and through my experience, it's about they don't like change. And it's about letting them know the benefits of the internet. Like you really have to break it down on a baby level, level to let them know. Like, think about it. In ten years, you're going to be needing this particular service to order your medicine online and those type of things. So I didn't want to steal your response to the question, but you really have to break down the benefits of the internet to them because they, they don't like change. And they're afraid. They're afraid. Okay. Well, closing comments from everyone. We have about ten minutes. Left. Um, let's start down on the end, Ms. Natasha. Um, oh gosh. I guess all I can say is just do what you want to do. That's what I try to tell everyone. This is a bloggers panel. We pretty much almost all of us started from the ground up um, without having a corporate brand or you know another entity behind us. So just go out. You never know where it's going to lead. Trust me. You never know. So just like you said, your friends are scared of the internet. They're scared of blogs. Start a blog. So what? Just talk about what you do every day. Do something crazy and maybe everybody else will follow in and see what you're doing and want to do their own thing. So it just has a huge effect on everything in life and I just encourage everyone to, even if you're doing it just as a side hobby that you only get to it once a week, just do it. It's just a good outlet and you never know where it's going to be. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to, I, I used to be some political blogger before uh, I've been doing Facebook uh, for a long time and, you know, the thing about blogging is it's just you got to do it because you love it, you know, because you've got to do it for your own self application not for the money, and you know, the money can be something that comes later. But, but you know, and it's it's really hard to produce content after the first three months. Like it is, you just hit a wall, and you just you don't want to do it. And it's, so you know, five little things, but it is you know, I think a uniquely rewarding thing uh, in the world there to to be able to blog and you know, um, join Facebook too. <laughs> um, I'll just give you three tips um, when you're blogging and working with advertisers and brands um, so that you can stay clear of FTC. Um, so the first <laughs> is to always disclose. So even if you're getting a product that's for free and you're not getting paid, that has to be disclosed too. And you should just make it as simple as possible and it should be in your voice. So it's as simple as saying, I was sent to Disney World on behalf of blah blah blah. And then you're, you're done, your disclosure is um, the second thing is, if you're a PR firm or a company, make sure that you are monitoring your endorsers and making sure that people who are working for you are making those disclosures, because um, you do have that responsibility. Um, and the third thing is, it's not only on blogs. Keep in mind, Twitter and Facebook, your disclosures have to be made there. So if you're saying, you know, I just uh, tried out these new cookies and they're fantastic, you have to put a disclosure in Twitter, um, and so you can. Do it how you want. You can create your own hashtag, you can make it pound paid, pound ad, whatever it is, but make sure you're making your disclosure right where the endorsement is. Oh, and I think, I didn't get a chance to do my PowerPoint, but I think there's copies out front, so you can take that too if you want, you know, to go into more detail about the FTC and what the guidelines <coughs> made for bloggers. 
So I would say to everyone uh, who's blogging in the room, keep blogging. Um, those of you who are commenting, keep commenting, keep liking, keep, twitt keep tweeting, keep sharing. Just keep the community going because I think having all of those lists is really valuable. Um, to those of you who are interested in considering an ad network, I urge you to check out BET's vertical ad network at BETadnetwork.com. Uh, we act as a broker to help join you to advertisers so you can actually make some money and help this blogging thing continue. I'd say it's all about definition, uh, defining your voice, defining whatever your business model is going to be, not letting somebody else's model uh, define you because what works for YBF isn't going to work for Facebook, isn't going to work for Mommy Law, isn't going to work for BPT, not for, you know, so on and so forth. Um, I'd also say, you know, take advantage of the opportunity to just leverage this tremendous tool, um, you know, that, called the internet that we can do so much with. And, and the last final thing, We'll have a follow-up discussion tomorrow, 9 a.m. Congressman Clyburn is also hosting uh, Government 2.0, looking at the way uh, politics and policy intersect with technology, social media, and we have happy flyers around here, so thank you very much. Uh, I would summarize this in three words. Content, community, and commerce. Content, which is where it all starts, create good content. If you don't have content, you don't have the rest. Community, it's not just about building an audience and getting people to your site, but it's about getting them to participate, to be part of the discussion that's taking place on your site. And then lastly, commerce, which is once you have that community, once you have those people that will thrive on being at your site, you can, make, you can earn money. You can sell advertising, you can do sponsorships, you can do events, you can do, uh, sell merchandise, um, lots of opportunities come up when you build those those aspects. So that's how I would summarize. For me, I, we didn't talk very much about Twitter, so I just wanted to do my Twitter spiel very quickly. I mean, I've fallen really hard for Twitter in the last year. Um, it is. I've gotten so like it's, oh, it's information overload. There's so much information that's freely flowing. You know, I'm in contact with people all around the world, um, black intellect, you know, we're having like a virtual conversation that's just running nonstop um, via Twitter. And it's, you know, microblogging, so it's, it's uh, it can be pretty engrossing, but it's only 140 characters at a time engrossing. So you can just, you know, just kind of dash off an idea in a link, um, you know, retweet somebody else's idea and share it with your, your network. You know, it's a, one of the exciting things about being online is just the free flow of information. And Twitter is like the, the easiest way to actually, to me, it's the easiest entry point into the many conversations that are going on, on online. So, love Facebook, but um, uh, I, I think Twitter has, has a lot of potential um, to be a really powerful um, tool, you know, for us to connect across the diaspora and, and exchange ideas and, and all that. And, that is not a paid endorsement, <laughs> it's not a payroll, I, I'm just a, uh, somebody who got into it. So. Thank you. you bring up a good point, but you don't have to disclose when it's not paid, because I see people do that and you don't have to do that, it's a bum and beyond. So thank you everyone for coming.